Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth forth the wind out of his treasuries. The title of the message this morning, let him that is a thirst come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather in your house. We pray that you would bless now as your word is preached that you would work in hearts, that you would open blinded eyes. Lord, I pray for those here this morning that have never been born again the Bible way. I pray today they'd be convicted of their sin and drawn to you. Bless the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to get through this series someday, I promise you. It may not be in your lifetime. <clears throat> Actually, this is week 13. After today, we will deal with the flood and Noah's Ark and then the fatal fruits of evolution as we trace the connection with the Holocaust and other atrocities. And that will conclude our series for the time being. Somewhere down the road a ways, we'll look at the wonders of the human body, the eyes, the ears, the brain, etc. But that's for another time. Today, we're going to look at water and the weather and what a miracle uh, water is, a miracle which we usually take for granted. The component parts of water are two gases Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is the most inflammable of gases, and oxygen is necessary for all fires. And yet combine the two, and you have a tremendous fire extinguisher. Lower temperatures on fluids uh, increase their weight. And this is true of water also. Until the temperature gets uh, within four degrees of freezing, when instead of the specific gravity increasing, water becomes lighter and rises to the surface as ice is formed. So it is as if a universal law has been suspended in one vital area. Is this just a coincidence? It is imperative to our survival that it be thus. If ice sank as soon as it formed, soon, soon lakes and rivers in much of the world would be frozen solid, and the result would be death to all their living inhabitants. The birds and animals that depend on the fish for food, as well as the lakes and the rivers for water, would also be affected. And because there would be insufficient time for thawing out in many regions, and because the more ice and snow you have, the more the sun's energy is reflected, winters would become increasingly longer and progressively more severe. And eventually, because the balance of the seasons and temperatures is so delicate... You would have an ice age from which the world could never recover. So by changing an almost universal law, God removes from ice its potential death-dealing properties and causes it to act as a shield from the even colder air above the surface of the lake or river, thereby protecting the fish and the creatures that are therein. And the point at which God changed that law and where God fixed the freezing point are items that you ought to give serious consideration to. Absolute zero is 459.7 degrees, basically 460 degrees below Fahrenheit zero. The boiling point of water is 212 degrees above zero Fahrenheit. And so 672 degrees separate the two extremes of temperature that water can be subjected to, 672 degrees. Anywhere along the line between those two extremes, God could have established the point at which water froze and at which ice melted. But we now know that even a small percentage point of change would have been a huge mistake for life to be able to exist. If instead of the freezing point being 32 degrees above zero... It was instead just 4% of that 672 degree range lower than it could rain in a temperature of 6 degrees above zero. Man and most warm-blooded animals would very quickly die of exposure with wet skin in such an environment. Most regions of the world would become uninhabitable for man and beast. Whereas now we have vast storehouses of snow that keep in reserve deposits of water against the heat and drought of summer. There would instead be winter floods on a colossal scale, a massive erosion and devastation. On the other hand, if God had set the freezing point just two 
6% higher in that 672 degree range, then there would be frost whenever the temperature dropped to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Snow and ice would never melt in vast regions of our planet that are currently inhabited and farmed by man. Now, there is one area where God made an exception to the water freezing at 32 degrees. Uh, in the oceans, God put an abundance of salt, thus keeping them at freezing, from freezing at 32 degrees. If it was not so, then in polar seas, the yearly thawing could not begin to balance the yearly freezing, and the ice would build up through the years until eventually everything was frozen solid. To keep such a disaster from happening, God put salt in the seas and ordered things such that evaporation would only remove fresh water back to water the land while leaving all the salt behind. Every parameter and property of water falls within narrow boundaries. And the more we study it, the more we realize how necessary those precise and narrow boundaries are for life to be possible. If water evaporated more rapidly, then there would be too much moisture in the air. And the land and vegetation would not get the necessary water to sustain life. If water evaporated less readily, then the oceans would become vast repositories, too infrequently and begrudgingly giving up their life-sustaining fluid, and most of the world would become a desert. Water in great quantities is needed to sustain life everywhere in this world. No water, no life is a basic law of the universe. And yet in this area, as in so many areas, there must be a precise amount. The acceptable parameters for sustaining life are narrow. There must be enough, but not too much. A mistake in either direction would be disastrous. And so you have to assume that we just happen to get really lucky here on planet Earth or that there is an all-wise creator God who knows what he's doing. Grant Jeffrey writes, the atmosphere of the earth is composed of precisely the right gases necessary for life to flourish. In addition, these gases exist in precisely the correct ratio to facilitate the complex biological processes that are essential for the enormously complex demands of plants and animal life as well as for humans. The atmosphere is composed of almost 79% nitrogen, a little less than 21% oxygen, a very small amount of other gases and water. Sigmund Brower wrote in the book, The Unrandom Universe, that the odds against this essential atmosphere, together with the water cycle forming on Earth by random chance alone, are approximately one chance in a hundred trillion trillion. And yet the evolutionist wants you to believe that that's exactly what happened. Significantly, the most respected physicist in the world, Stephen Hawking, summarized the implications of his remarkable discoveries about the universe's first moments. He said, the odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think clearly there are religious implications whenever you start to discuss the origins of the universe. There must be religious overtones. But I think most scientists prefer to shy away from the religious side of it. Yeah, I think so. Professor Robert Jastrow, although he is an agnostic, admits that the universe was constructed within very narrow limits in such a way that man could dwell in it. This result is called the anthropic principle. It is the most theistic result ever to come out of science, in my view. Well, Psalm 115, 16 said, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. Isaiah 45, 18, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. And there is none else. Now, if man were making a world, he would make it almost completely dry land. You know, he'd stick a few pretty lakes and rivers here and there, and maybe an ocean or two, but it would be mostly dry land. But we find that there are 52 million square miles of land, and there are 145 million square miles of water. Only 29% of the surface of the earth is dry land. Man wouldn't plan it that way. Yet scientists now understand and agree that that is the right percentage. Even 50-50 or 60% water wouldn't work. Do you know that there are over 60 billion gallons of water? Over 60 billion gallons of water for every person on earth. 
and yet they don't want you to wash down your driveway. No, just kidding. <clears throat> there is an area of scientific study which concerns itself with the weight and balance of the earth. That branch of science is known as isostasy. This did not come into full understanding by scientists until the year 1959, just 53 years ago. We now know that the earth is perfectly balanced. There is equal weight to support landmass and valleys and mountains and plains and bodies of water. Our earth has incredible equilibrium. The waters in the ocean exert pressure upon the shore, and that constant pressure, that pushing is necessary to keep the mountains up. And by the way, water has been called a universal solvent, and yet the sandy seashores do not dissolve under the constant onslaught of the waves. The earth has different weights of mountains and ridges and soil and rock in different places to balance things out. The mountains and valleys and the ridges and the furrows and the hills and the hollows are all necessary. If the earth were a round, even ball, the water would run at random over its surfaces, uh, thus making life impossible. So there had to be tremendous excavations in the surface of the earth, deep enough and wide enough to hold the vast amounts of water necessary. The Bible talks of all these things written thousands of years ago, and yet it is scientifically accurate today. If you doubt the inspiration of the Bible, then I would challenge you to read a hundred-year-old science book. It is hopelessly out of date. The Bible doesn't claim to be a science book, but it is scientifically correct. In fact, read a 50-year-old science book or even a 20-year-old science book. They must be continually revised and corrected and updated. The Bible is thousands of years old, and yet it needs no updating at all. Here's from evolutionist Michael Denton. The doctrine of continuity, or evolutionary theory, has always necessitated a retreat from pure empiricism, facts and scientific testing, and contrary to what is widely assumed by evolutionary biologists today, it has always been the anti-evolutionists, not the evolutionists, in the scientific community who have stuck rigidly to the facts and adhered to a more strictly empirical approach. This is an evolutionist saying it's the anti-evolutionists, in other words, the creationists, who have always stuck rigidly to the facts. A lot of evolutionists get really worried whenever anybody begins to really examine their theory. Listen to this advice to evolution teachers from a leading advocate of evolution. This is a great quote. He says, from the beginning of the American anti-evolution movement, the driving force has been the same, a struggle for souls. Avoid debates. If your local campus Christian fellowship asks you to defend evolution, please decline. Have you ever watched the Harlem Globetrotters, he asked, play the Washington Federals? The Federals get off some good shots, but who remembers them? The purpose of the game is to see the Globetrotters beat the other team, and you will probably get beaten. That's an evolutionist saying, don't debate the creationists, you're going to lose. That's one evolutionist warning to other evolutionists. But why will they get beaten? Because the truth is overwhelmingly obvious when you begin to study with an open mind. Again, Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The truth is so obvious that evolutionists have to warn you to disregard it. Here's from evolutionist Jerry Coyne. If anything is true about nature, it is that plants and animals seem intricately and almost perfectly designed for living their lives. Nature resembles a well-oiled machine with every species an intricate cog or gear. What does all this seem to imply? A master mechanic, of course. Here's Richard Dawkins. Biology is the study of complicated things that have the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Both of these quotes come from page one of their respective books. They have to tell you right away, reject the evidence. Because all the evidence seems to point to the fact that there's a master designer, a creator, because this is all so perfectly put together. Here's from the book, What Darwin Got Wrong, Creatures Evolved to Fit Their Ecologies That They Do Cannot Be an Accident. Divine solicitude might explain it, but we are committed to a naturalistic biology, so God is out. We're not even going to consider that there could be a God. 
Notice, however, that this guarantee is an offer only on the assumption that the direction of evolution is sensitive primarily to exogenous or external factors. If you drop that assumption, then the excellent fit between creatures and their environment is a plain miracle. So the argument concludes we had better not drop that assumption because then we'll have to admit that there is a God. Even while rejecting Christianity, Paul Davies wrote in New Scientist, the temptation to believe that the universe is the product of some sort of design, a manifestation of subtle aesthetic and mathematical judgment is overwhelming. The belief that there is something behind it all is one that I personally share with, I suspect, a majority of physicists. John Polkinghorne had a career as a distinguished physicist at Cambridge University. He writes, when you realize that the laws of nature must be incredibly finely tuned to produce the universe we see, that conspires to plant the idea that the universe did not just happen, but that there must be a purpose behind it. You know, you don't have to go too far back to find absolute nonsense from science. Not that evolution is sensible either, mind you. The Reader's Digest in March of 1997 recorded some old scientific beliefs in the area of nature. This is from uh, quote-unquote scientists. Mice were thought to regenerate spontaneously from rag piles. Frogs and turtles climbed out of puddles spawned by magic spring rains. Birds changed into other animals to get through the frigid months. How come the Bible contains no foolishness like this? Nothing like this. It has nothing that is untrue. It was written far prior to the stuff that I just read you. Why does it contain none of this? Because it was written by God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. It wasn't an accident. He measured them and meted out heaven with a span and comprehended uh, the dust of the earth in a measure. The word comprehended in the Hebrew is to keep in or to maintain, to put in its proper place the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. It's not an accident. Science didn't find out until 1959 that it was all measured perfectly and weighed out. In Psalm 33, 7, he gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Ecclesiastes 1, 7, all the rivers run into the sea. Yet the sea is not full into the place from whence the rivers came. Come thither, they return again. You know, it wasn't until the 16th century that we began to understand what the Bible has stated all along. Man used to believe in huge subterranean reservoirs with inexhaustible supplies of water. And some worried that the reservoirs were exhaustible and that we would eventually run out. But Ecclesiastes 1.7 was written thousands of years before uh, science discovered those truths. And yet it was in the Bible quite simply all along. The Bible deals with evaporation, precipitation, condensation, the whole water cycle, which we now understand and take for granted. But hundreds of years ago, they didn't understand it all. The Bible explains it. Since water runs downhill and all living things need water, divine creation was needed to bring about the water cycle. He said, well, that's easy, evaporation. But wait a minute. Seawater is 800 times heavier than air. 800 times. How are you going to get that to go up? How do we evaporate that? Well, when water is vaporized by the sun's rays, the sun changes it instantly and noiselessly into molecules of watery vapor. These molecules now operate, occupy 1,600 times the space that they did previously. And so they weigh half as much as air, become water vapor balloons floating high into the sky. How much water do you think evaporates from the earth every second? Every second. The scientists estimate that 16 million tons of water are evaporated from the earth every second. God designed it that way. Now, evaporation alone does not help the pine tree that needs water high on a mountain 7,000 feet above sea level. For one thing, ocean water is salty. That would kill the pine tree providentially when the seawater evaporates. As we mentioned, it leaves the saline content behind. In Psalm 135, 7, he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. Proverbs 8 speaks of the highest part of the dust of the world. A rather strange statement at first glance. And yet those two verses explain how God gets the water from the ocean to the pine tree 7,000 feet up on a hillside miles away. 
One of the things that causes the raindrop to form is the dust moat that droplets can form on. Scientists tell us that about 8 million droplets are necessary to make a single drop of rain. In fact, if you want to get even smaller in considering water, scientists tell us that there are as many molecules in one teaspoon of water as there are teaspoons of water in the Atlantic Ocean. Think about that for a moment. So what is this highest part of dust? Astronomers tell us that more than 20 million meteors reach our atmosphere every 24 hours and are burned up into dust. So there you have as many dust motes as you need. Scientists tell us that there are as many as 6 trillion raindrops in one cloud. Each of those raindrops is charged with electricity. Even if there is no visible lightning flash, there is always electricity when there is rain. Every time there is lightning, nitrogen is produced. The rain carries this nitrogen to the ground and washes it into the soil. It's necessary for the trees and the grass and the gardens. Again, Psalm 135, 7, He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth forth, he bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. So we have the vapors ascending, evaporation, and lightning, which brings the rain and enriches it, just like God said. But we have one final problem. If the water evaporates upward and then surrounds a speck of dust to eventually rain back down, all we have is raindrops falling on the ocean or on, on lakes. Listen to the final part of Psalm 135.7. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. The water evaporates from the ocean, leaving the salt behind. Dust moats are created every single day for raindrops to form. Water carries that moisture many miles from where it first evaporated. Lightning enriches the raindrops and sends them earthward, watering the pine tree at 7,000 feet above sea level. The Bible mentions all those necessary ingredients. And it was written thousands of years before scientists discovered those truths. Thousands of years. Do you think still that it was written by man and not inspired by God? We said scientists estimate that 16 million tons evaporate every second. Likewise, some 16 million tons fall to the earth every second and rain, snow, and hail. And most of that water falls softly and gently to the earth. Were it not so, then every rain cloud would be an object of terror if the clouds reach a certain saturation point and then were rent by the weight of the moisture they contain, then great floods and streams of water falling from the sky would bring mass destruction and death. And Job 26, 8 says, He bindeth up the waters in his, in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent unto them. It's not just the rain that's miraculous. Consider also the snow. A snowflake is 24 times lighter than a raindrop. A snowflake is made up of tiny, thousands of tiny ice crystals. There are many different categories of snowflakes. Some are called prisms, some are called dendrites, some are called plates. You are familiar undoubtedly with the fact that no two snowflakes are exactly alike. But have you ever really thought about that? Untold trillions and trillions of snowflakes, all of them different. Perhaps that's why God said, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? It takes a little speck of dust or pollution for a snowflake to form. When cold water vapor bumps into an even colder speck of dust, condensation takes place. And the moisture comes out of the water vapor gas and forms around the little speck. And water vapor condenses when it is chilled just a little below its own temperature. And that, the piece or speck of cold dust does the chilling, causing the condensation. Instantly, the moisture freezes around the little speck of dust. And an ice crystal is formed, a tiny little baby snowflake. But it can't fall to the earth just yet. It needs to grow first. Before man will see it fall to the earth as a snowflake, it will need to pick up nearly one quintillion water molecules. And that's a one with 18 zeros behind it. Just think of what it takes to make one snowflake. And yet trillions can fall in a short amount of time, all of them different. What a mighty God we serve. Snow is not just for beauty. Snow provides a warm blanket for the earth where winters are severe. The snow settles into a compact layer and prevents the internal heat of the ground from escaping so that when spring comes again, life can bloom again. Also, the mountains of snow piled high on the ranges provide an incredible reservoir of water for during the heat of summer when life-giving liquid will flow to the plains below where it's desperately needed. Rain and snow also bring down minerals and nutrients, valuable nitrates of inestimable value as they flow down from the mountains. 
The atmosphere is something we don't usually give much thought to, and yet we find that it is perfectly suited to maintain life. The air pressure must all fall within narrow parameters. Two factors determine the air pressure, the weight of the gases composing the atmosphere and the height to which the air goes. A slight change in either of these areas could result in greatly increased or decreased pressure, either of which would make life on earth impossible. John Maynard Smith writes, it turns out that the physical constants have just the values required to ensure that the universe contains stars with planets capable of supporting intelligent life. The simplest interpretation is that the universe was designed by a creator who intended that intelligent life should evolve. Now, this interpretation lies outside science. That's how quickly and cavalierly, easily evolutionists dismiss all the evidence uh, that this lies outside science. In their book, Cosmic Coincidences, Dark Matter, Mankind, and Anthropic Cosmology, cosmologist John Gribben and astronomer Sir Martin Rees wrote about the infinite complexity and interconnectedness of every one of the fundamental forces that are so arranged to provide what is essential to the existence of our universe and to human life itself. Everything just ties together perfectly. The conditions in our universe really do seem to be uniquely suitable for life forms like ourselves and perhaps even for, even for any form of organic complexity. Paul Davies wrote, alternatively, the, the numerical coincidences could be regarded as evidence of design. The delicate fine-tuning in the values of the constants necessary so that the various branches of physics can dovetail so felicitously might be attributed to God. It is hard to resist the impression that the present structure of the universe, apparently so sensitive to minor alterations in the numbers, has been rather carefully thought out. Such a conclusion can, of course, only be subjective. In the end, it boils down to a question of belief. Is it easier to believe in a cosmic designer than the multiplicity of universes necessary for the weak anthropic principle to work? Job tells us that the Lord gives weight to the winds... Science has learned this only recently. The humidity of the atmosphere is very important. Without water vapor in the atmosphere, our conditions would b become a lot more like the moon with wildly varying temperatures between day and night. The atmosphere is necessary to diffuse the light of the sun's rays, the blues of the heavens, and the glories of the sunset we owe to the atmosphere. With the atmos without the atmosphere, the sky would become black as ebony, out of which the sun would shine like a red-hot ball. Its beams would reveal only those objects on which they directly fell or on which they were reflected. At the close of the day, the, su the sun would just suddenly plunge out of view, leaving us in utter darkness. There are so many things that we take for granted and don't even think about, and yet a master designer has brilliantly engineered every area, even down to the minutest detail. The precise ratio between the proton and the electron is a fundamental number governing our universe uh, Stephen Hawking stated the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make life, to make possible the development of life. The astronomer John D. Barrow has written about the significance of the anthropic principle in his book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. He noted that water, one of the most vital elements in the existence for all of life, it is an incredibly unusual and unlikely element to have formed in our universe. He says, water is actually one of the strangest substances known to science. This may seem a rather odd thing to say about a substance as familiar as water, but it is surely true. Its specific heat, its surface tension, and most of its other physical properties have values anomalously higher or lower than those of any other known material. These aspects, or the chemical and physical structure of water, make water a uniquely useful liquid and the basis for living things. The biologist Dr. Lawrence J. Henderson wrote about the remarkable appearance in our universe of the absolutely essential elements necessary to the existence of our universe and human life, hydrogen and oxygen, and the incredible odds against these particular elements being formed by random chance rather than through intelligent design. He writes, there is in truth not one chance in countless millions of millions that the many unique properties of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and especially of their stable compounds, water and carbonic acid, which chiefly make up the atmosphere of a new planet, should simultaneously occur in the three elements otherwise than through the operation of a natural law which somehow connects them together. There is no greater probability that these unique properties should be without due cause uniquely favorable to the organic mechanism. The, these are no mere accidents. An explanation is to seek. It must be admitted, however, that no explanation is at hand. 
amazing. Here's an evolutionist so committed to his biased viewpoint that he would say there's not one chance in countless millions of millions that these could form simultaneously. But we have no explanation for how they did. All he has to do is pick up a Bible and go to the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The astronomer Dr. Paul Davies has written about the strong evidence that points to the fact that this universe looks like it was designed by a super intelligent designer with a very specific purpose involving humanity. He says, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. Professor Davies also wrote the laws which enable the universe to come into being spontaneously seem themselves to be the product of exceedingly ingenious design. If physics is the product of design, the universe must have a purpose, and the evidence of modern physics suggests strongly to me that the purpose includes us. And yet he misses it. You can choose to believe it all happened by chance if you want to, but the Bible says you're a fool if you do. I say that not to offend you, but to let you know where you stand in the eyes of God. You don't believe in God, you say? What do you believe in then? Surely not evolution. It's not hard to disprove evolution. There are hundreds of questions that evolutionists cannot answer. They have no evidence to support their theory. No, you'll need to come up with something else. On what are you going to base your life and your eternity? Why is there placed within man a vacuum that only a relationship with God can fill? Lee Iacocca, past president of Ford and Chrysler, said, as I start the twilight years of my life, I try to look back and figure out what it was all about. I'm still not sure what is meant by good fortune and success. I know fame and power are for the birds. And yet he lived his life pursuing those. They never filled up the void in his life. Andrew Carnegie said millionaires seldom smile, and yet they live their lives pursuing all that money to find out it couldn't fill the void inside of them. John Jacob Astor, first American multimillionaire, said, I am the most miserable man on earth. Rodney Dangerfield, entertainer, said, I have never been happy. My whole life has been a downer never been happy, yet pursued after humor and entertainment to find out it couldn't fill the void in his life. Elvis Presley, singer and entertainer at age 22, said, I'm probably the most miserable young man you've ever seen. Later in life, he said, all my life I wanted a Cadillac, and now I have a whole fleet of them, and they don't mean a thing. He died at 42, drug addicted, bloated, and burnt out. Jim Carrey, the actor, said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Does it fill the void in his life? Mark Twain had a lot of wit and tremendous literary skill, but he didn't have God. He lived his life without him. The following is from the autobiography of Samuel Langhorne Clemens, better known by his pen name, Mark Twain. He said, a myriad of men are born, they labor and struggle and sweat for bread. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them and infirmities follow. Shame and humiliation bring down their pride and vanities. Those they love are taken from them and the joy of life is turned to aching grief. The burden of pain, care, misery grows heavier year by year. At length, ambition is dead. Longing for relief is in its place. It comes at last. The only unpoisoned gift earth has for them and they vanished from a world where they were of no consequence, where they achieved nothing, where they were a mistake and a failure and a foolishness, where they left no sign that they had ever existed, a world that will lament them a day and forget them forever. That's from a man that lived his life without God. Twain struck a similar note in the book, The Mysterious Stranger, published in 1916, six years after his death. It contains this life. Line, life is all a dream, a grotesque and foolish dream. And Thomas C. Wolfe, the novelist, said, The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that the sense of loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon peculiar to myself and a few other solitary people, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. 
all this hideous doubt, despair, and dark confusion of the soul, life has come to nothing. Isaac Asimov had this to say, I'm an atheist, out and out. It took me a long time to say it. I've been an atheist for years and years. But somehow I felt it was intellectually unrespectable to say that one was an atheist because it assumed knowledge that one didn't have. Somehow it was better to say one was a humanist or an agnostic. I finally decided that I'm a creature of emotion as well as of reason. Emotionally, I'm an atheist. I don't have the evidence to prove that God doesn't exist, but I so strongly suspect he doesn't that I don't want to waste my time. By the way, he knows now. Furthermore, I can't help but believe that eternal happiness would eventually be boring. I cannot grasp the notion of eternal anything. My own way of thinking is that after death, there is nothingness. Nothingness is the only thing that I think is worth accepting. What a philosophy of life. William Provine said, no inherent moral or ethical laws exist, nor are there absolute guiding principles for human society. The universe cares nothing for us, and we have no ultimate meaning in life. Malcolm Muggridge, English journalist, said, I may, I suppose, regard myself as a relatively successful man. Yet I say to you, and I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs, his successes in life, multiply these tiny triumphs by millions, add them all up together, and they are nothing less than nothing. Forbes magazine, for its 75th anniversary issue, invited scholars from around the world to address the question, why are we so unhappy? Oh, listen, there's a God-shaped vacuum in man's life. And until he gets right with his creator, he can try to fill it up with anything he wants to, but it'll always drain back out. Lee Atwater, presidential campaign manager, wealth, power, prestige, I acquired more than most, but you can acquire all you want and still feel empty. Tom Brady, New England Patriots quarterback, why do I have these three Super Bowl rings and still think there is something greater out there for me? I reached my goal, my dream. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't what it's all cracked up to be. I reached my dream. I, I attained my goal, but I'm still empty inside. Oh, there are people who say, oh, if I could be the quarterback on the Super Bowl championship winning team, oh, I'd be happy. No, not if you don't know God. Eventually, all that drains out. Jerry West, former Los Angeles Lakers executive vice president, did not attend any Laker playoff games in the last two rounds of his last year with the team. He said he could not bring himself to watch. He told the USA Today that he was simply tired of it all. He said, every game I watch is like going to the dentist. Winning is not enough. It's a sickness with me. I just want to disappear. I mean, people say, oh, to be him to be there around the players and have the best seat in the house. He said, I, it was like going to the dentist, even go to a Laker playoff game. John D. Rockefeller said, I've made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. No wonder Ephesians 2 says that those who are without God are without hope. Isaiah 57, 20, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You say, well, I, I've done some wrong things, but I'm not wicked. Listen, until you become born again, until you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, God says you're wicked. You're a lawbreaker. You've broken his laws. Go all the way down. You've broken them. You can't even get past commandment number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You see, every one of us, we want to be God of our own life. We don't want God to have first place in our lives. We want first place. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. So we don't even get past commandment number one. We're lawbreakers. The Bible says there'll never be any peace. You'll never, you'll never satisfy the longing, the aching, the emptiness in your soul outside of knowing God. We've talked about water today in some of its forms, water and ice and vapor and rain and snow and hail. The Bible speaks many times of water. Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hear us say, come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Oh, all those things you try to fill your life with, God says, just come to me. You're trying to satisfy, trying to quench that thirst, and, and you can try to satisfy it with alcohol or drugs or achievements, entertainments, prestige and power, entertainment, amusement, you name it. You can try to fill it with all of those things. 
you know when you pillow your head at night, there's still an emptiness inside. There's still something that's not right. And so you can try to fill it with religion and you can light candles and you can pray prayers and you can have your prayer beads and you can get catechized and confirmed and baptized and go through all of those religious rituals. And still you feel like something's missing. Have I done enough? Am I in? Will I make it to heaven when I die? And God says, will you come to me? Not with religion, not with your good works. Come with your sin. Repent of your sin and trust Christ. You that are thirsty, come. And John 4 says, He and he is Jesus left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I should give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You know what the problem with you're trying to fill that void with alcohol or drugs or sex, or pleasure, or things, or money, or accomplishments, or fame and prestige. You have to go back and do it again, and again, and again, and again, because it keeps emptying out. But Jesus said, I have water, I have eternal life-giving water, that once you take of this water, you'll never thirst again. The water you drink every day is an amazing thing, but it's nothing compared to the water of life. And David prayed that the Lord would wash him and then he would be whiter than snow. Jesus offers you living water. He'll cleanse every sin and every stain. He'll wash away your sins. And you know what it's like to get a bath when you've been dirty? It feels so good. Most people look forward to a nice bath or shower, but not everybody. And some people don't. They're so used to their dirt, they don't think much of it. They no longer realize how bad they smell. They don't realize how good a bath would be. Oh, it's the same way spiritually. Perhaps you don't realize how good it would be to be cleansed of all your sin, to come clean with God of all your sin. You've lived in sin so long, and you don't realize how you smell to God. Even if you're religious this morning, the Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. Oh, you sit here this morning and say, well, I, I've gone to church for years. I was a choir boy. I was an altar boy. I've gone through a catechism classes. I, I've been confirmed, and I, I've kept the sacraments, and I, I've had this. And God says, it, none of it matters. It's all filthy rags. So I try to do the best I can, leave my little corner of the world better than I found it. I'm kind to people, and I, I give to the poor, and I, I even volunteer at the rescue mission on Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, and, I, and you go on and on and on, and the Bible says all of that's filthy rags because God is absolutely holy absolutely righteous today's the day to come clean we're not talking about baptism the waters of baptism can never wash away your sins the bible says the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all our sin and john the baptist stood that day as recorded in john chapter 1 and verse 29 he said behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world your candles can't do it. Your prayers can't do it. Your prayer beads can't do it. Your catechism classes can't do it. Only the Lord Jesus Christ shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary is a sacrifice that a holy, righteous God would accept on your behalf to pay your sin debt, on my behalf to pay my sin debt. Oh, today's the day to come clean. Let God wash away your sins and give you that water of life that will never pass away. James Nicholson wrote a beautiful hymn, the first two stanzas, which go like this, Lord Jesus I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith, for thy cleansing, I, for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. 
Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Have every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. wonder how many of you would say this morning, I already know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. There's been a time in my life when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. I've been born again the Bible way. Would you slip your hand up nice and high if you can say you know for sure you've trusted Christ, your Savior. Thank you. You can put them down. Some of you could not raise your hand. How many of you this morning say, Pastor, with, with, with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, Pastor, I don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I might have religion. I try to do, be a good person, but I, I've never been born again the Bible way. Would you pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up real quickly, put it right back down? Would you put your hand up? Pastor, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, put it right back down. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for those here this morning that have come seeking, searching. There's an emptiness in their soul, an emptiness in their life. They've never been born again the Bible way. I thank you for convicting them of their sin this morning. Lord, I pray that you draw them. That all the things that they've tried to fit into their lives to fill that void, that emptiness, they'll never, never work. That you, their creator, want to have a relationship with them. You want to be their savior. I pray you draw them this morning.